welcome back to another true crime video. I am so sorry for the last video. It was posted on Monday instead of Thursday. I was trying to manage posting that video on time and also uni deadline. I thought it would be good if I did a proper face-to-face -face introduction on this one to give you guys a serious verbal warning on this case. Viewer discretion is so, so, so advised on this. It is so graphic. It involves children. There's not really any words to describe his crimes, except absolutely horrific. I will put up a list involving trigger warnings. So if you think this video may trigger you, please just do not watch. The only thing I can really say is have a comedy, have something that will cheer you up after this video. And especially if you watch the documentary and do further research, this case will stay with you. When I was doing my research and stuff, I wish I could go back and delete the things that I have read. I'm being serious. Um, I read through his whole diary. I read through everything because obviously I'm going to so I can provide as much detail as I can for you guys. On a serious note, my heart goes out to each individual victim that has ever came across this man. My heart goes out to the victims and families. I, I just can't even comprehend, to be honest, um, what they must have went through. Stay safe out there, guys. Thank you for all the support you have shown me and enjoy. Wesley Allen Dodd was born in Washington State on July 3rd, 1961. Dodd grew up in what has been described as a loveless home and was often neglected by his parents in favour of his two younger siblings. Despite Dodd dismissing claims about having experienced abuse or negligence during his adolescence, Dodd's diary revealed differently. The Seattle Times reported that Dodd's diary, which had been written during his imprisonment, recounts how his father was both physically and emotionally abusive towards him, and that he had witnessed aggressive fights between his parents growing up. At the age of just 13 years old, Dodd began to reflect the abuses he had experienced at home. Dodds began exposing himself to children that passed by his house. Then, he started bicycling around the streets looking for opportunities to expose himself. His parents knew of his strange behaviour, and they failed to get him help because they were too preoccupied with their own problems, including a bitter divorce. His behaviour continued to grow even more disturbing after the divorce of his parents. He began assaulting his six-year-old and eight-year-old cousins, along with the child of a woman whom his father was dating. During his teenage years, Dodd was described as an attractive, fairly intelligent, and personable young man. These qualities helped him in finding part-time jobs where he was entrusted with the care of children. He would often babysit for his neighbors, seizing the private time to assault the children he was caring for as they slept. He worked as a camp counselor during the summer months, taking advantage of children's trust and admiration for him. Dodd spent most of his teen years devising new and better ways to abuse children. He learned how to combine this adult persona with this sense of closeness and almost brotherhood to completely control his young and innocent victims. He would entice them into playing doctor or dare them to go skinny dipping with him. He took advantage of their natural curiosity and often normalized what he did by offering it as a grown-up treat. In August 1981, Dodd attempted to lure in two little girls, but was reported to the police. However, he received no punishment and joined the Navy the following month. His enlistment, however, did not put an end to his pedophilic desires, and he continued to prey on children whilst being stationed in Washington. After being dishonorably discharged from the Navy for attempting to indecent liberties, he was arrested twice for attempted molestation. However, due to many parents' reluctance to put their traumatized child through the court system, Dodd's penalties rarely resulted in jail time. And honestly, don't come for the child's parents because the court system can be very, very traumatizing. So I really don't blame the parents because also these kids would have been very young. 
In the meantime, Dodd's fantasies were escalating, and he began to carefully plan his attacks. He kept a diary, filling its pages with his morbid fantasies of what and how he would like to do to his future victims. And due to this lack of punishment, Dodd's fantasies just continued to get worse and spiral out of control. He began to experience thoughts of torture, mutilation, and cannibalism. In 1987, when Dodd was 26 years old, he could no longer resist the temptation to kill. His first attempt failed when an eight-year-old boy that Dodd had lured into the woods managed to escape back to where his mom was sitting. He told his mom to call the police, and Dodd was apprehended. Yet again, Dodd received just another slap on the wrist. In spite of the prosecutor stressing his history of these sex crimes, he served 118 days in jail and one year probation. As time went on, you can tell by his diary entries that he began to depersonalize his targets, thinking of them as it rather than he or she. He wrote in his diary, if I can just get it home. On many failed attempts, over the Labor Day weekend at David Douglas Park, Dodd gave up, but the pressure to indulge his morbid desires and fantasies and to kill a young child was just so overpowering, and he returned to David Douglas Park in the early hours of the evening, determined not to fail this time. The first children who fell victim to Dodd's temptations were 11-year-old Cole Near and his little brother, 10-year-old William. The two boys had been taking a shortcut home through the park, and they happened to bump into Dodd. Dodd forced the boys to follow him, and once they were off the trail, Dodd molested and stabbed them and then proceeded to clean up the evidence, all in the matter of 20 minutes. Allegedly, Cole took most of the abuse, probably in an attempt to save his younger brother. But sadly, nothing could save either boy from Wesley Allen Dodd. William was found first, still alive, but unfortunately he would die shortly after being taken to the hospital. Several hours after the Nears reported that their sons were missing, Cole's body was found. At first, Dodd was worried that the police would somehow link him to the murder of the Near brothers. However, the police had no leads to the murders that he had committed, and his sadistic thoughts only got worse by his success of these kills. I'm not going to go into detail about what Dodd wanted to do to these victims, because it is just... It's just too much, but it's online, you can see for yourself, but it is just, oh, it's just horrendous. When Dodd realized that the police weren't after him for the murders of the near boys, he began to plan his next move. Now, he either moved to Portland, Oregon, or he just went there to commit crimes. He wandered parks and playgrounds and movie theaters, and after several failed attempts, Dodd wandered into the Richmond school playground where he noticed Lee Aselli, only four years old, playing by himself. Now, his nine-year-old brother, Justin, was there. However, Lee was playing away from his brother. Dodd offered Lee the chance to have some fun and make some money, trying to gain the boy's trust. However, Lee knew not to talk to strangers, and Lee declined. So Dodd forced the resisting boy into his car. Dodd tried to soothe the boy by claiming to be a friend of Lee's father that sent him to pick him up. Once they arrived at Dodd's apartment, the four-year-old boy was exposed to the most unspeakable acts of abuse and torture. Dodd made sure to document it with pictures and entries in his diary. He strangled Lee to death in the early morning, only to revive him in repeating this horrendous torture. Dodd finished it when he hung Lee to die in his closet and took more pictures of the boy's body. Before heading to work the following morning as a shipping clerk at Pack Paper, Dodd hid Lee's body behind some blankets and a sleeping bag on a shelf in his closet. Now, when I read this, like, this is just horrific. So Dodds made an entry in his diary that he would now have to find a place to dump the garbage. 
Yes, he is talking about Lee, this four-year-old boy that he abducted and murdered. He dumped the little boy by a Vancouver lake, and then he took all of Lee's clothing and burnt them in a trash barrel except from his Ghostbusters underwear, which he kept as a souvenir. Lee's father, Robert, still had hope. Although Lee had been missing for several days, Robert made a public statement expressing the hope that Lee had been taken by a lonely but sympathetic person and would return Lee home safely. However, on the morning of November 1st, 1989, Lee's body was found. His murder, along with the Nears brothers' murder, which was a month prior, caused the start of a manhunt for this killer but there was just no leads other than some composite sketches provided by witnesses in Oregon. Dr. Ronald Turco prepared a psychological profile of the killer. I don't know about you, but I find psychological profiling so interesting because there has been some cases where these doctors just get them so spot on. This is the psychological profile of the killer. He would be 25 to 35 years old, and kicked out of the military if he served. He would be a loner and probably kept photos of his victims, a diary of his offenses including clipped articles and child pornography. The killer probably chose boys because he saw girls as defective. Dodd laid low in his apartment whilst making plans for his next abduction. He began to construct a torture rack to use on his next victim. Thankfully, it was never used. Dodd avoided the local parks and decided that a movie theatre would be a good place to hunt for his next victim. On November 13th, Dodd went to the New Liberty Theatre. He waited for a young child to go unattended to the restroom. Due to the boy's cries and struggles as he was being carried out of the theatre, employees became suspicious. The theatre staff knew that this just wasn't a tantrum and the boy's screams were different so they pursued it. Once outside the theatre, Dodd was scrambling to get the boy into the car, but the boy broke away and ran to two people pursuing him, clinging to them, crying, that man was going to hurt me. Dodd fled the scene as the two staff brought the boy back into the theatre. In the theatre, the boy's mother's boyfriend, William Ray Graves, found out about the abduction whilst he was searching for the six-year-old boy. William spotted Dodd's car in the distance after the car had luckily broken down not far from the theatre. In order not to raise suspicion, the boyfriend offered to help Dodd, but once he was able to, he held Dodd in a headlock and pulled him back to the theatre. Dodd was interrogated by police from Washington and Oregon as a suspect in the murders of the Near brothers in Lee. At first, he denied having any knowledge about the children and maintained he only meant to molest the child from the theatre. Then, after three days, Dodd's whole attitude changed and he confessed to the crimes, revealing all of the shocking details of what he did to the children. He directed police to his diary, Lee's Ghostbusters underwear, the incriminating photos, and the unused torture rack. According to various sources, Dodd molested around 50 to 170 children. Dodd was charged with three counts of first-degree murder plus attempted kidnapping from the New Liberty Theatre. Against his lawyer's advice, he pleaded not guilty, but later changed that to guilty. It was up to the jury to decide the penalty. They were shown the diary, pictures, and other evidence. Dodd's defense called no witnesses and presented no evidence. Dodd's attorney, Lee Dane, did offer that no sane person would be capable of these crimes. Dodd received the death sentence on July 15, 1990. Dodd refused to appeal his death penalty and chose to hang as the method of execution, claiming he wanted to experience what Lee had experienced. His date of execution was set for January 5th, 1993. He received a lot of media attention because no legal hanging had been done in the US since 1965. Dodd enjoyed telling his story to the media and he wrote a pamphlet on how to avoid child molesters entitled, 
when you meet a stranger. During the months before his execution, Dodd seemingly turned to the Bible for comfort. During one of his interviews, he said, I believe what the Bible teaches. I'll go to heaven. I have doubts, but I'd really like to believe that I would be able to go there. I would be able to go up to the three little boys and give them a hug and tell them how sorry I am and be able to love them with real true love and have no desire to hurt them in any way. Wesley Allen Dodds was executed at 12.05 a.m. on June 5, 1993. His final statement was, I once asked somebody, I don't remember who, if there was any way sex offenders could be stopped. I said no. I was wrong. I was wrong when I said there was no hope, no peace. There is hope. There is peace. I found both in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the Lord and you will find peace. There was no apologies for his crime and no obvious look of remorse. Outside the prison, those who were in support of the execution could be heard chanting rhymes like, What the heck? Stretch his neck. While the known supporters wept at the news that his execution had gone on as planned. Well, that is the end of today's video. I hope everyone is okay after watching that because I know it was really, really gruesome. Remember to stay safe out there, guys. If you would like to subscribe, that would be amazing. And hopefully I will see you in my next videos. Bye!